Welcome to the next episode of For the Love of You. We're so lucky to have Dr. Fayad here from Nebraska Medicine. Um, just a little bit about Dr. Fayad. He is a stroke neurologist, a professor of um, neurology here at UNMC, and also director of the stroke um, program. So thank you for coming. Thank you. So we're gonna just talk a little bit about stroke today. Um, can you describe what a stroke is and some little details about that for us? Yeah. So uh, a stroke is a permanent damage to the brain that is related to a blood vessel that uh, uh, generally causes two types of stroke. One is the most common one is called an ischemic stroke where you have a lack of blood to the brain that causes the damage. And one is a bleeding stroke or hemorrhagic stroke where the damage to the brain is caused by a rupture of the blood vessel and the blood that comes out destroys the brain around it. The bottom line is that there is a damage to the brain and that damage makes the brain lose a function that is either in uh, loss of speech, loss of uh, strength, loss of sensations, loss of vision, loss of balance, and that's what a stroke is. So perfect, you described some signs and symptoms there. What do I do if I'm having a stroke or if someone I know is having a stroke? Yeah, I think before we get to that, I wanted to make sure that people understand that when they talk about stroke, many people confuse it with a heart attack. Uh, stroke happens in the brain as opposed to a heart attack that happens in the heart. Um, so it is not a heart attack, it is a brain attack. And when someone has a brain attack or a stroke, then they need to recognize that there are five major types of symptoms that happen. Most of the stroke happens suddenly or when someone wakes up from their sleep with either loss of uh, with weakness on one side or the other, with loss of sensations on one side or the other, with loss of vision on one side or the other, or both sides, loss of uh, speech or ability to speak or understand speech, uh, sudden loss of balance, and finally having the worst headache that someone has ever had. Uh, whenever you hear or see these symptoms uh, in someone, then you need to be alert that this could be a stroke and it should be evaluated emergently. So I should call 911. So what do you do when you call when you have a stroke or when you see someone having a stroke? Absolutely. That's the best, most efficient way to get where you need to be and get the appropriate treatment that you deserve. Perfect. Um, is there any treatment that can happen when you have a stroke or are you just yeah. stuck with the, the having a stroke? That's a great question. And unfortunately, there are still a lot of people who know or suspect that they have a stroke, or maybe they don't know that they're having a stroke, but they don't want to believe that they are having a stroke because uh, they think that they are too young uh, or maybe that they're too healthy to have a stroke, but uh, anyone can have a stroke. Uh, the highest risk of stroke is after the age of 65, but uh, more than 35% of all strokes happen under the age of 55. So it is a common thing, and everyone can have a stroke. Everyone and anyone. So. The reason why we talk about stroke as an emergency is because we have outstanding treatments now to treat stroke. We have many options, and all of these have to be done as soon as possible. As they say, time is brain, and meaning that the more time you waste, the more brain you waste, and the more time you save to get to a treatment, the more brain you save. And when we talk about time, there are different ways of thinking about it. You shouldn't worry about it. What you should worry about 
is trying to get to a hospital that is specialized or dedicated to stroke treatment where these treatments can be given to you and do it as soon as possible. It, it gets complicated, but stroke treatments that can reverse the deficits from a stroke can be given for up to 24 hours, depending what your type of stroke is, what your condition is, and so on. So you need to have the specialized people who are trained to evaluate you, to decide what type of treatment is best for you, and give you the right treatment and monitor you accordingly. Because stroke can be a life-threatening illness and uh, certainly one of the leading cause of disability in adults. And the sooner you take care of it, the better. We have the two types of treatment that we have is what we call a clot buster or IVTPA that can be given for up to four and a half hours. Um, and uh, the other type is when you have a big clot that has blocked one of the major blood vessels, then uh, a special procedure can be done where a catheter is inserted into the blood vessel and uh, take that clot out to bring back the blood flow to the brain that is suffering from a lack of oxygen and nutrients. So these are not uh, simple, easy, or without risks, but has to be delivered by the right people and to the right person. So you said TPA can be given up to four and a half hours, so That's correct. I shouldn't wait for four and a half hours after no. I have my symptoms. In fact, for any of these treatments that we have, the sooner you give it, the better the outcome is even though they are can be effective for up to four and a half hours or 24 hours. Perfect. How can I prevent from having a stroke? So, uh, so the key question is, uh, again, once you have a stroke, you need to be uh, treated in the right place and you need to recover from it. Uh, make sure you don't have complications. You need to get the appropriate treatment to prevent stroke and then get rehab and try to get reintegrated, regain some of those functions and, and then focus on preventing stroke. And preventing stroke is important especially for those who had a stroke or for those who are at risk for stroke. And there is an entity called a mini stroke or transient ischemic attack or a warning for a stroke that one should take very seriously even though the symptoms resolve completely because that is the best way to prevent a stroke. Anyone who has a stroke or a TIA or a mini stroke have the highest risk of having another stroke and having it within the next 90 days, within the next year, within the next two years. And that's why we, uh, anyone who has any hint of a stroke should be treated very aggressively and should be evaluated as soon as possible before they develop a stroke or another stroke. So what type of evaluation do we do? So number one, if someone has a stroke, what do we do? We try to find out what caused their stroke because that puts them at risk for, the higher, uh, for a higher risk for another stroke of that kind. So do they have a blockage in one of the big, big blood vessels inside the brain or in the neck? And these can sometimes benefit from having surgery to try to open up that blockage or a stent, or sometimes just treatment with medications. That sometimes will help, even though it doesn't resolve it, but at least it can prevent a stroke. Uh, if a stroke comes from the heart, we tend to, uh, depending what the cause is, we tend to treat it with strong blood thinners that can prevent another stroke. And uh, finally, for the vast majority of people using aspirin or 
uh, compounds like aspirin that could thin the blood a little bit along with a cholesterol medication, uh, treating blood pressure, and, uh, and managing the diet, exercise, losing weight. All of these are factors that are essential to prevent a stroke. So when, when someone has a stroke, uh, or even if they don't have a stroke, they should ask themselves, am I at risk for stroke? And how do I know that I am at risk for stroke? So the biggest one is, did I ever have a stroke or a TIA? And then what we talked about. But then you want to know, does stroke or high blood pressure or high cholesterol or heart disease or atrial fibrillation run in my family? That puts me at risk for any of these risks. Uh, for example, some uh, ethnicity is also important. African Americans have the highest risk for stroke of all ethnic backgrounds and have the highest risk of dying from it. Um, and whether it's men or women, and they benefit the most from an aggressive treatment of risk factors and stroke prevention. Hispanics are also at risk for a higher risk of uh, blockages inside the of the blood vessels inside the skull. So knowing all these factors can help. So then, you know, uh, if, uh, if I haven't had my blood pressure checked, you should check your blood pressure to know whether you have high blood pressure or not. What's a high blood pressure? What's a high blood pressure? That's a great question. And for a long time, there has been controversies over what is considered high blood pressure. The bottom line is that uh, everything is pointing towards uh, having a normal blood pressure as the target if you have um, if you are on treatment or if you're not on treatment and a normal blood pressure is about 120 over 85 that's what is considered normal so many people who have high blood pressure come and ask well my blood pressure runs 150 is it okay well it is not okay uh, so if you're taking medications they should be adjusted to drop the blood pressure back to a normal level. Otherwise, you will have damage to the brain, damage to the heart, damage to the kidneys, and that all adds up in increasing the risk. Cholesterol. For a long time, there have been a lot of controversies, and every time we have new guidelines, people get uh, flustered as, well, what about the new guidelines? It doesn't say the same thing as the old guidelines, and so on. Well, the bottom line is everything heading towards trying to have uh, an individualized approach to cholesterol treatment, meaning that you should talk to your doctor about what is the best way for you to have a cholesterol level that is uh, that indicates that you are at low risk for stroke or heart attack. And the bottom line is we like most people to have a bad cholesterol or LDL less than 100. If you have stroke or heart disease, we would like it less than 70. But there are ways to individualize the risk uh, by talking to your doctors and, uh, and taking the appropriate medications, changing your diet, losing weight, and doing exercise. All of these can help. So um, knowing all of these uh, is important. And uh, for example, diabetes is a big risk for stroke. Smoking. Do I smoke? And smoking even some people say, well, I smoke only one cigarette a day, you know, or two cigarettes a day. Well, it doesn't matter. 
any smoking increases the risk and should be discontinued to lower the risk of stroke and heart disease. Uh, diabetes should be treated aggressively to lower the risk of stroke, of kidney disease, or of heart disease. All of these get affected by diabetes, even the eyes as well. Uh, so managing all these risks, knowing what are your risks is essential, and treating them aggressively is essential. And this is a teamwork. You can't do it alone. You have to do it with the guidance of your doctor or primary uh, caregiver so that you can lower your risk, especially if you have those risks in your family. You can't do anything about your family. You can't deny your family and lower your risk, right? So <laughs> you need to know if you are at risk because you inherited those risks, but also work on taking your medications and knowing what are your risks because everyone is different and the more of these risks that you have the higher the risk of stroke we have a lot of knowledge now about what causes a stroke we have a lot of knowledge about uh, what types of treatment reduce a stroke we have many options, either with medications, with surgery, with interventions, to lower the risk of stroke in different individuals according to what their risks are. And the bottom line is we need to know who you are, what risks you have, and how to reduce the risks to the best we can. You don't have to have a stroke. That's the bottom line. And you, like you said earlier, you can be at any age to have any of those risk factors. That's correct. So uh, many people ask, well, I don't feel like I have high blood pressure. Why should I check it? Well, that high blood pressure is what they call is a silent killer, just like diabetes, because you don't know you have high blood pressure unless you measure it. You don't know you have diabetes unless you measure your blood sugar. Um, and the only way to do it is measure it. And sometimes you have to measure it more than once, several times a week, uh, especially if you know that it runs in your family. Um, what can treat blood pressure besides medication? You can change your diet with low salt, with what we call a Mediterranean diet, where you have uh, a higher... A proportion of vegetables and fruit, more fish, uh, less fat, and a more grain, complex uh, grain essentially that can improve your lower sugar and so on. And that in addition to exercise and uh, regular exercise and when we talk about regular exercise we're not talking about running a marathon you do not need to run a marathon to lower your risk for stroke all you need is about a half hour 45 minutes of brisk walking five times a week and that will do the trick in getting your heart pumping fine you're lowering your blood pressure and keeping your blood vessels at a better state. Um, a lot of people that I see in, uh, that come and see me ask, well, I don't want to take a statin, for example. A lot of people hear from others that they had side effects from statins, uh, or they read on the internet that uh, taking these cholesterol medications uh, can cause you trouble. Well, everyone is different. And uh, statins are some of the medications that have been proven and studied the best at lowering the risk from high cholesterol. Um, and they are the most effective. Uh, I have a lot of patients asking me, well, should I take instead 
some herbal preparations and supplements that can do better than statins and then I don't have to worry about them. Well, so far, we do not have any evidence that these herbal supplements uh, work and we have no idea about what their side effects are. And unfortunately, a lot of our patients are spending money, spending effort at taking these extra pills when they, we're not sure that they even help. And we don't even know what side effects they have. So it is important to stick to what your doctor gives you. And don't look too much on the internet. Don't get biased by what other people tell you side effects they have because you are different. Every person has a different reaction to medications. A lot of patients don't want to even hear about having a blood thinner, a strong blood thinner. Why? Because they read something on TV, they saw something on TV that says, oh, this is a terrible drug or so on. Well, all drugs can be terrible if they are not used properly, if they are not used adequately, if they are not monitored, and if they are not taken, taken according to directions. So if, if someone is taking a medication, taking more of it doesn't make it better, or taking less of it doesn't make it better. You have to take it according to what is proven to work and what is proven to be effective. So um, the, uh, the key is to try to know you, if you, what type of risks you have, know about your family and family health, uh, identify what type of risk factors you have, and work with your uh, primary care provider to uh, get on the right medications, get on the right treatment, but don't depend on the primary care provider alone to manage your health. You have to take charge of that. You have to know what your blood pressure is. If you have high blood pressure, then you should forever continue to monitor your blood pressure at home. It's not enough to do it in the office. Uh, if you have diabetes, you need to know your numbers. You need to know what's your hemoglobin A1C. And unfortunately, many people don't pay attention to that. Uh, if, you, uh, if you eat, you need to know what you're eating. You need to read labels. You need, and it's best to prepare your own food because then you know how much salt you're putting, how much fat you're putting, how much, um, what you're eating. And it is healthier always to prepare fresh food uh, from fresh ingredients and eat it rather than eating canned food that has a high content of uh, preservatives, has high content of salt um, that you're not aware of, uh, and eat less uh, sugar or sugary drinks and don't use drugs if you use drugs. Don't have neck manipulations at a chiropractor because we know that especially in younger people that can increase the risk to injury to the blood vessels and cause a stroke even in young people. Uh, you can have a massage but don't have your neck cracked. And many people crack their neck on their own. They should not because that also increases that risk. Really? Wow. Yeah. And uh, finally, uh, if you're overweight, lose weight. Lose it slowly but steadily. If you don't have a lot of exercise, try brisk walkings, especially now that winter time is coming. <laughs> Go to the mall. Or at work, just go and walk uh, over lunchtime. And uh, that's, that should be good enough to lower your risk. Uh, manage your diet. 
take your medications and monitor yourself. And that, that is key. And teach others. Learn what a stroke present and know that if you have a stroke, where would I want to go? Where could I get the treatment that I need if you are at the high risk for stroke? And uh, engage with your primary physician. Talk to them about these risks and, uh, and get yourself in shape. Perfect. All well, right. Thank you so much for sharing all that wealth of information and joining us today for the love of you. Um, thank you for joining us and we look forward for you viewing our next episode. Have a wonderful day.